Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Jason's Take On podcast series. As usual, it's myself, Jason Noble, over here in London in the UK, and Jason Whitehead over the pond in the US. For this episode, we are thrilled to be joined by the one and only Paul Henderson, all the way from sunny Australia. So this really is a very global podcast with someone on three different major continents around the world. Um, bearing that in mind, we may have slight audio delays, given that we've got a couple of oceans and land masses between us all. So please excuse them as they are. Paul, welcome to, to the Jason series on the podcast. Thanks, Jason. It's um, great to be here. We have to get um, used to that idea of using Jason in the pool. <laughs> it's taken, it's taken us two years to get used to it. <laughs> Paul, look, we're, we're both really excited to have you here. And I think you know, a lot of the work that you've been doing around outcomes is really pivotal to what a lot of people are doing now in customer success in the wider business but please could you just introduce yourself to the to the to the listeners here tell them who you know what you're doing kind of a bit about your background sure so um i'm a, a consultant speaker and author i help technology companies make customer outcomes their central focus um, so how did i come to be doing that my background um not surprisingly it's technology so i um, previously worked in uh, the software industry uh, my last role was running the Asia Pacific region for um, an ERP software company. So I had about 200 people across nine countries supporting 800 enterprise customers. In the last five years that I was in that role, two significant things happened. The first is that globally, the company changed from being an on-premise vendor to a cloud vendor or SaaS vendor um, with all the fun that goes with making that transition. <laughs> um, we all know that transition. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, the second was that in my region, I decided that we were not doing enough for customers to create genuine business outcomes for them. And so I wanted to tackle that. I wanted to do something more about that. So I hired some very smart people. And between us, we developed and successfully ran an outcomes program for over five years. About towards the end of that five year period, I realized a couple of things. First is, that I was seeing other technology companies starting to move down that outcomes path. And I thought that with the experience I had, I might be able to help them. The second was that I realized, you know, I actually really care about this. That um, I really actually do not think it's okay that companies spend a lot of money on technology and don't get a great business outcome from it. And so I felt like I wanted to tackle it. So I had been writing a book, um, my first book, as a bit of a hobby, it's about outcomes, but it's about the internal use of outcomes. Um, I quit the company I was working for. I started Outcome Leaders. I published the first book and then got to work writing the second book, which is really around customer outcomes. Now, it took me a year and a half of research and writing to get that book written, um, which was done about a year and a half ago. And, uh, and since then, I've been building a practice around that idea of making customer outcomes the central focus of a technology vendor. Fantastic. And, you know, I, I followed you on LinkedIn for ages now, and I love what you post up there. And you have a really a lot of great points there. So really um, excited that you're here and looking forward to hearing your thoughts on, on this great topic. Well, thank you for that. And it is a pleasure to be here. I think, Paul, that's, that's just such a, a fantastic intro. And I love the way you've kind of, you've gone through this journey yourself and kind of come to that realization that there's a huge problem here, or there was a couple of years ago that no one's addressing. And this is where, and I guess the timing is almost where customer success came into, into the fore, forefront of everyone's mind as well. And the idea of outcomes, hmm. experiences, you know, and this is why we're having this conversation. You know, I think outcomes are ultimately a really critical way of a critical part of how we deliver success to our customers and ultimately our own businesses. And, you know, one of the big problems is that they are misunderstood or, or just not understood by many, many people. I think, you know, the word outcomes and idea can mean really different things to different people. Could you give some context as to what, what you mean by outcomes and how, how you kind of came up with the thinking around it? Yeah, it's a very good point. You know, it is, it is absolutely one of those words that, you know, everyone's got their own view about what it means. <laughs> right. And I know that there, are some, there are some very powerful players in the technology industry that are implementing outcome programs like SAP, Microsoft, Salesforce, Adobe. Yeah. Uh, ServiceNow, MuleSoft and others. So it, it feels like this thing has momentum, but each of them are doing some doing things slightly differently. So uh, let me see if I can give some context about what I have in mind when we talk about outcomes. 
So the first idea is that whenever somebody buys something, there is an outcome they want to achieve. So you buy a hamburger, you want to be full. You buy a movie ticket, you'd like to be entertained. Buy a sports car, a pretty good chance you'd like to be noticed. So there's always an outcome. It doesn't matter what, the, what it is, there's always somewhere an outcome that it, that it should lead to. So in the tech space, there are two different types of outcomes that we deal with. The first is the product outcome. So that's the direct benefit of using our product or service. The second is the success outcome. That's the bigger outcome that the customer is actually trying to get to. And let me give you a couple of non-tech examples to try and explain the difference between them. So if you went to a hardware store and you bought a drill bit, then the hardware store manager would know you don't really want to own a drill bit. What you want to do is drill a hole in the wall. So you pay for the drill bit, you take it home, and if you use it properly, you get a hole in the wall. That's a product outcome, the direct benefit of using the product or, out, uh, or service. But who wants a hole in the wall? Uh, what we want is that beautiful picture that we've just had framed hanging on the wall at home. When we can step back and admire that picture hanging in a great spot on the wall, then we experience a feeling of success. That's the success outcome. Similarly, if we went to a restaurant, the restaurant owner might think their job is to provide great food and service. And they're right, you know, if the food and service is no good, no good we're never going back. But that's not the only reason we go. We go for a great night out with family and friends. So we pay for the food and service. And if it's good, we've had a product outcome. But the great night out is the real reason we go. That's our success outcome. So why is that difference important? So let's imagine we've hung the photo, I hung the picture, we step back ready to uh, admire our handiwork and it looks terrible, it's in the wrong place, we've, we've just hung it badly. Then the next time there's a job to be done around the house, we may get a handyman and not go back to the hardware store and spend money with them. So through no fault of the hardware store and its manager, they will lose future revenue. Similarly, if we go to the restaurant and the food's good, but maybe we're with a group and a couple of people have an argument and it really spoils the night, we probably won't go back to that restaurant because it has bad connotations for us now. So the, the food and service was fine, the product outcome was just as it should have been, but because the success outcome wasn't achieved, that restaurant loses future revenue. So one of the central or perhaps the central idea of the book is that that is exactly what happens in technology. That we provide a product and service, we really focus on making that work, but it's only one part of what's required for a bigger business outcome, the success outcome to be achieved. So phrasing that, the amount a customer spends next time is driven by the success they have this time, and success for the customer is the success outcome not the product outcome. Our product is a means to an end. It's not enough by itself. So in these days of SaaS recurring revenue, when the power has shifted back to customers, we need to be aware of the success outcome that we enable for customers. And we need to do more to make sure that they actually achieve it. Because if they don't, even if it's not our fault, it will cost us future revenue. I, I really like that, Paul. I think that that's fantastic. And I've spoken to clients too about that whole whole idea of, um, you know, what is their business success outcome that they're looking for? And I point out to them, if the business perceived that they could achieve this outcome without buying your product and spending all the time and hassle to do that, they would. So part mm -hmm. of your job is to make them feel that they can get the outcome faster and easier with you than without you. And mm -hmm. I, you know, what you just talked about is so critical to that, you know? Yeah, I like that point. It is a, it's a strong point. But you, you really want to show that you're critical to that outcome um, and not, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah maybe, they could, maybe they could get there, but boy, it'll be tough. You know, so, yeah, I like that point, Jason. You know, and, and I love your point too about the restaurant having bad connotations for no fault of your own. I think we've all had, I, I know there's several restaurants in, in parts of town that I no longer go back to because of just <laughs> the horrific experience <laughs> in my personal life, my, my 20s, I'm like, oh dear. Um, but Anyway, so, but coming back to, you know, I think that distinction is really important. And, you know, I think a lot of people get focused on the trees and not the forest and, you know, what is, how, how, how quickly can you get that hole built as opposed to get the, the picture hung in the right place. 
Um, as you're thinking about this and, and you know, what exactly is included in an outcomes program to get there? How, how does, what does that look like? Because I think you made the distinction very nicely, but so what is, what's an outcomes program and why are we talking about how it gets together? Right, okay. So, um, you know, I think there's a couple of elements to it and then how you implement it might be a separate question, but the, the core elements for me, um, the first is you need to be crystal clear about the outcome that you enable for your customers. So, you know, I, I hear commentators sometimes talk about the idea of going asking customers what outcome they, you know, the customer would like to achieve. You know, I've done that. And, and more often than not, you get that deer in the headlights look, you know, the customer going, oh, no, I can't, I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And even if they do, everyone will have a different, a different answer to that. And that doesn't scale. So that from my, in my view, you must be clear about an outcome that you enable, a core outcome that we call the success outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first thing. Be crystal clear. Have an opinion. You know, turn up with insight about an outcome that you can help the customer create. Um, this, the second element of this is that it needs to be a recurring or a repeating cycle of engagement driven around continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most tech vendors, we're a bit ad hoc and a bit transactional in the way that we engage with customers. So we want to turn that into a repeating cycle of engagement where every year or, or more frequently with perhaps simpler products, we're going back to the customer and we're saying, What's the next initiative for driving improvement in the success outcome? So maybe let me give you a little bit of an example and, and that will help illustrate that. And I'll try and come back to that um, to use that to illustrate as we go through. So imagine we're a, a mythical marketing automation vendor. Then that marketing automation vendor, what might be the success outcome that, that they serve? Um, most people would say, well, it's about pipeline. Mm -hmm. But the CEO of the customer has not approved expenditure for a marketing automation system to get just more pipeline. What the CEO wants is more sales. Right. So it's a particular type of pipeline. It's pipeline that sales can close. And it's one of the big problems between sales and marketing. That, you know, sales keeps saying marketing is sending me leads that are, that are no good. Um, marketing says sales don't follow up leads. You know, what's the point of creating them? And it's a mess. So a, a great marketing automation vendor would help their customers create closable pipeline. And I think that's a great success outcome for a marketing autom automation company to have. So the first thing is then everything revolves around that. The, the repeating cycle of engagement is every year, what's the next business initiative to further improve the closable pipeline? to narrow it down better and better to the ideal prospect or just to increase the volume of it. The second part of this or the third part of this is alignment. So the idea of a success outcome gives every department a common focus. Everyone has just this one single phrase, 10 syllables or less is the guideline for a success outcome. So not 10 words, 10 syllables to capture the essence of what you do as a company. And now everybody knows it. So everybody in that marketing automation company knows their job is to talk about and help implement and make happen closable pipeline for their customers. So be crystal clear, develop this idea of continuous improvement around a repeating cycle of engagement, align all of your business for everything from sales, marketing, services, onboarding, product management, product development. Their job is to build products that further enable the success outcome, that increase your ability as a vendor to deliver that great business outcome for your customers. So they're, you know, the kind of the elements that, uh, that I think a customer, a great customer success program ought to have. I think you've, you've hit on some really, really key points there. And one, one that really resonates with me is you, you've kind of hit the essence of what customer centricity is all about. You know, our, our, our customers have new initiatives, new ideas, new directions it, on a continual basis. They're continually changing themselves. And, and for me, the whole, the whole idea about being customer centric is how you can keep up that, with those changes for your customer. Mm -hmm. I, and you can only do that by being in this cycle. It's not, not repetitive necessarily, but it being this cyclical way that you can continually engage with them, continually deliver outcomes, understand what other outcomes they want. So that, that, 
kind of idea of repeating engagement and the right level of engagement, I think is a really, really key thing. And it's, it's difficult to do right. You've got a lot of competition. People are still going for that first sale that first year. And, and right now there are some challenges and gaps around, well, what do we do next for that customer? How do we make right. sure we're keeping those conversations yeah. to, to make sure this is a long-term partnership where we're continually drew, delivering more outcomes and more value? And I think right. that is something that a lot of organizations still miss. The, the other really key thing that I think you've hit on is when you, when you have the idea of product success, you, you're having conversations with multiple stakeholders at a customer. And it's something that you and I, Jason, have spoke about before. But each of those stakeholders has their own idea as to what success is. And for mm -hmm. some, it might be product success, but you've got to reach out to the person that is about that customer success. You know, what, what does those success outcomes rather, sorry, you know, the product outcomes and success outcomes. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that quite often is different to the person that might be using your products and services, but you've got to be aware of those multiple stakeholders and potentially different levels of conversation mm -hmm. that you need to have, which, which again, without without some structure and a program and doing it more ad hoc is a really challenging thing to get right. And, and I really like what you said about the, um, the distinction between like a marketing wanting to build a pipeline versus, uh, you know, the CEO wanting a, a closable pipeline that results in more sales and, and pieces like that. So I think so many times, um, it, whether it's traditional CS programs or just so many times with clients, people get really focused on looking for the best answer to the wrong question. And it sounds like with this outcomes-based approach, you're really trying to find, you know, the best answer to the right question, which I think is important. Yeah, right. And I, I love um, boiling it down to 10 syllables and not words. I, I wrote that down, <laughs> a really important thing. I mean, if, it's, if, you, if you can nail that, I can see where people can, can retain it and, and execute against it. That's, that's really yeah. hard to do though. I mean, I'm gonna challenge myself to try and do that, but that, that's brilliant. I think it's a really good idea. I was going to say some really, really phenomenal insights there into kind of what these programs are about and, and, and kind of why we need to do them. Could you, could you share some kind of more insights now on how you'd go about setting up an outcome program? You know, what, what are the kind of steps you'd need to take? Um, you know, who's involved? Kind of how, how do you go about doing the practical side of it? Okay. So um, there's two big parts to, to an outcome program. Um, there's, what do we do for our customers? And then the second is, how do we do it? So let's address that first one of what do we do for our customers? So we call this creating an outcome structure. So an outcome structure starts with the success outcome. So the core thing that you do for your customers. This is your guiding light. This is that, you know, that 10 syllable phrase or less. Everybody knows what it is you do. Everybody focuses on that. That drives your whole organization and your whole reason for being in existence. So we're gonna clarify that. We're gonna, we're gonna get ahead around what our success outcome is. I wanna now introduce this idea of an outcome hierarchy. So think about an organization chart, your own organization or, or a customer's organization. There'll be a CEO at the top um, below that, there'll be some vice presidents, maybe vice president of marketing, vice president of sales, and so on. Below that, some middle management. Below that, the rest of the organization. In every one of those boxes, there is an outcome that that position is responsible for delivering. So the CEO has an outcome of stakeholder return. The vice president of marketing is about pipeline, hopefully closable pipeline. The, uh, the vice president of sales is about sales revenue and so on through the organization. At each level in the organization, the outcome is achieved through a series of outcomes below it being achieved. So if the vice president of sales and marketing and all the other vice presidents, if they deliver their outcomes, there's a good chance the CEO will deliver her or his uh, outcome. So they cascade down, they build up and cascade down. So we're gonna apply that thinking. So we've defined our success outcome. At a layer below that, there are going to be some smaller outcomes that are required to be achieved by a customer in order for that bigger outcome to be achieved. So um, we call those contributing outcomes because they contribute to the achievement of the success outcome. So our, our fabled marketing automation vendor um, has the success outcome of 
closable pipeline. What might examples of these contributing outcomes might be? Well, the first thing is that you need to get the interest of prospects. Um, and so interest gained is, a, is an outcome. You need to be clear about who you're trying to attract. So ideal prospect, ident clarified or defined, is an outcome that needs to be in place. These days, you need to start building relationships. So it's not just about finding them, it's actually about relationship building and trust building. So trust built is another contributing outcome. Another is, we talked about this problem of the clash between sales and marketing. So we need that resolved. We need there to be a smooth path with very clear understanding of what marketing does and when, what sales does and when, and how they will link. So we want like a service level agreement between those two departments as to how they'll operate together. So that's another contributing outcome. So there's typically four to eight for any um, success outcome of these contributing outcomes. So we're going to define that as well. We're going to say, we've got a success outcome and now we've got four to eight of these contributing outcomes. So think about that on a piece of paper, draw a circle, uh, put, the, put the, the page in landscape, draw a circle up in the top, that's your success outcome. Below that, draw, say, five circles, maybe four, maybe, four, maybe six, but five circles, and connect them as if they were in an organisation chart. Each one of those circles is your contributing outcome. On that one piece of paper, you have the entire structure that you need to run an outcome program. That summarises everything that you do for your customers. And anybody can pick up that piece of paper, go have a conversation with a customer and explain it and talk about it. You know, you don't have to be the world's greatest expert to talk about what closable pipeline means or ideal prospect defined means or interest garnered means or service level agreement defined means. So our customer success teams can go have those conversations using that single piece of paper. How do we use it? So when we're going after new logo business, new, um, new, new companies, um, we're gonna talk success outcomes. And the first project that we do with them, we'll try and address all five of the contributing outcomes at some level. When we go back a year later and we're talking continuous improvement, it's much more likely that we will hone in on one of the contributing outcomes. And we evaluate with the customer where the biggest opportunity for improvement next is. And it'll be a business initiative that we jointly evaluate with the customer to identify an improvement that can be made in the success outcome, in the closable pipeline, through fixing one of the other areas, doing that better. Garnering interest, for example, might be in year, at the end of one, year one. That's our next project. Let's do better at that. And we're going to help the customer with everything that's required, not just getting our product working. We need to understand all the things the customer needs to achieve that contributing outcome of interest garnered and get that better. And then the following year, we'll go back and we'll have the same conversation. And this time, we might focus on a different contributing outcome. And the, the business initiative that we agree with the customer will be around that different contributing outcome. We do not need to sell our product. If the customer buys into the idea of continuous improvement and we jointly identify a contributing outcome that can be improved, our products and services will go along for the ride. So we stop being product salespeople we start being initiators of business initiatives that drive improvements in the outcomes. And that's how customer success can drive expansion revenue without having to ever be product salespeople. That model allows CS to be revenue creators with, without having to be salespeople. That's so, nice. Yeah. And I've worked with a lot of CS teams that are fearful of sales and fearful of asking for renewals, yet at the same time, have this expectation they will do exactly that. And, and the approach you outlined, I think would give a lot of CS folks a lot of confidence and comfort to engage customers doing what they enjoy doing anyway. 
in where they are, you know, most successful and most empowered. That's great. Okay, so we've got our one piece of paper. It's got a circle at the top and it's got five circles underneath. When we've got everything we need for our outcome program structure. The second part of it is, how do we do it? How are we going to engage? So we're going to create an outcome life cycle. So an outcome life cycle has three elements to it. The first is the customer journey. So what is the journey that the customer is going on? And it's not their journey with us. We need to break that thinking. We need to define the, the journey that the customer actually goes on. And we're involved in some of it today. We need to be involved in all of it. It starts typically with an executive deciding that some aspect of the business results need to improve. So there is basically no buying cycle unless someone with enough power, an executive, says, do something about this area of the business. Then we might have a buying cycle. So that is the first step for me in a customer journey. Some people go one step back and say there needs to be a catalyst to make that happen. And, and you could do that. You could say that as well. So there's typically 10 or 12 of these steps in a customer journey. And, and it's surprisingly common across all technology vendors. The second element of this customer life cycle is what we call the outcome cycle. So for every step in the customer journey, we're going to define the outcome that we want to achieve. So for example, the first step is the customer executive is thinking about results. The outcome we want to achieve is the executive decides to act, that they do need to improve. Then we've got a chance of creating some revenue of actually getting a buying cycle going. So for every one of those steps in the, in the customer journey, we define an outcome that we want to achieve. The third part of the, uh, of the outcome life cycle is the engagement cycle. Very simple. How do we achieve the outcome at every step of the customer journey? What are we going to do to make that happen? So, for example, in our high-touch customers, the executive is thinking about results. We want to convince the executive that he or she should act. An executive business review is a great way of doing that. So we want an outcome-focused executive business review. By the way, just as a little aside, we ran those in my last company. I banned my salespeople from talking product. I, I looked at their PowerPoints and I said, you are not allowed to have any slides in there that talk about product. You are there to talk to executives about business outcomes and how to get there. That's what they want to hear about. They do not care about our products. I think so, two, there's one really key thing there. There's two with, with executive business reviews, QBRs, whatever you want to call them. There's too much focus on what we're doing. I, I, and you can get them in there. It's, I, I, I don't like the title of them. For me, they've always been about customer value reviews. You're there about understanding, A, what outcomes have you achieved for them? Mm. But to your point, what, what outcomes are they looking to achieve next? That's the key well, thing, not, not product. Yes, I totally agree. So we've got our, so we've got our um, now another sheet of paper at the top, in the top quartile, Draw five boxes, uh, sorry, 10 boxes. That's going to represent the customer journey. Below, below that, directly aligned with each of those boxes, draw 10 diamonds. They're the outcome that we're going to achieve at every step of the customer journey. Below that, draw 10 circles. That represents how we're going to achieve the outcome at each step. The one thing that we can add to that, if we have multiple segments, and most tech vendors do, then we need a different engagement cycle for each of those segments. So for example, our, our high touch, that first step, we're gonna run an executive business review. We're not gonna do that for our tech touch customers. Right. But the outcome that we want to achieve, which is the executive thinks about results and decides to act is totally the same. So now we've got a frame of reference for driving our tech touch model. Same customer journey, same outcome cycle. Now we just have to achieve it differently. How are we gonna do it? Well, let's send some benchmarking data or a competitive analysis or a self-service tool that allows an executive to self-evaluate the results in the area that we help them with. 
so that the executive decides by himself or herself, yeah, we need to act without us having to personally be involved. Same outcome, the executive decides to act, achieved in a different way for different segments. So now we've got our piece of paper, a row of squares at the top, a row of diamonds in the second row, a row of circles, and a different row of circles for each segment. We now have our entire life cycle. That single piece of paper describes everything we need to know about how we're gonna run our outcome cycle. We are gonna drive this repeating cycle of engagement using that simple diagram on one page. So our entire outcome program now is on two pieces of paper. The first one has got a circle and five circles below it. That's our outcome structure. That defines what we do for our customers. Our other page has got a row of squares, a row of diamonds, a row of circles. That captures how we're gonna do it. That is our outcome program. That's fantastic. While you were talking, I was just drawing out those two pages <laughs> right there. And I love the simplicity and the clarity with which you, you share that. And I think a lot of people, especially folks that are looking to set up a CS program from scratch, they easily get overwhelmed. And they, yep. you know, and being able to boil it down to such things so simple, I think really enables a lot of people to act and move forward. That's fantastic, Paul. I really like what you did there. Well, what are your, your thoughts for me? That, that, that structure, the, the simplicity of it is absolutely incredible. And that, I love the way you finished and said there are two sheets of paper. I, and that, that is the whole structure. And there are, to your point, Jason, a, a lot of people spend you know, far too long coming up with these in-depth strategies, plans, and even I think customer journeys, people get confused as to what they are and think too inwardly. But how do you kind of, one, one, one kind of the finishing question for you is how, how do you go about as a CS leader or a business leader, what are the key things you do to actually implement the program? We know, we know why to do it. We know what the program looks like, but what are some of the key steps you do to get your business to understand actually we need to do it and this is the, the key steps we need to take to, to move forward? Okay. So, you know, it, it's got to start with being clear about the outcome that you serve and get that outcome structure right. You know, if you have that, then right away, you can start having conversations with customers. You know, you don't have to be the world's greatest expert, but you can go talk closable pipeline. You can go talk service level agreement between sales and marketing. They're conversations that you can start having right away without everything else in place even. Second thing you need to do, um, you do need, I would suggest with this that you run a pilot. Yep. So don't try and do this big bang. So the second thing is choose, choose a segment and then choose some customers that you're going to go pilot this on um, and then figure it out. You know, you'll, you know what we learned. You'll, you'll skin your knees and fall over and, you know, get yourself up, dust yourself <laughs> off. And Absolutely. <laughs> it's continuous improvement of yourself as well, you know, of your own program. Um, the third thing then is you're going to, you're going to work out your life cycle. And, and I love the idea of customer success taking charge of the customer life cycle because frankly no one else in the organization does it this is a wonderful opportunity for cs so and the idea of driving it as a repeating cycle of engagement you know sales account managers they've been supposed to have done that for years and frankly you know I, that's my background we're lousy at it you know what we want to do is work on a deal. If there's not a deal, then it's a hard slog getting us to do anything else. <laughs> Driving a repeating cycle of engagement requires a disciplined approach. It requires setup and organization. And, and I think CS, this is a wonderful role for CS to take over. And so the, get that repeating cycle of engagement, your life cycle defined, and start running it. Start setting up some executive business reviews. You know, mm -hmm. sit down and think about what would an executive business review based on outcomes look like? Just draw some agenda items. You can figure this out. Um, and, and go start having some of those executive business reviews and ban product. Don't talk about product and yep. don't talk about support calls and the number of support calls you had. You know, talk about the outcomes and how you're going to help the customer get to those outcomes. That is what gets you to executive levels and keeps you there. If you go and talk about product, they will delegate you down to the level of the organization that deals with product. 
Right. If you go talk outcomes, that's what they get paid to deliver. You've got your relationship at the executive level. So that's the second thing. Get that, get that in place. The, the next thing is start developing this, what I call success consulting. Mm -hmm. So our traditional consultants are experts in the product and how to make it work. Many of them are industry experts as well, but they apply that industry knowledge to how to get the product working. But the customer has got to do a bunch of other things to get their success outcome. In our vendor world, we need to know what those things are. We need to know the whole of the success outcome. And it works really, really well if you've got some people who know what the whole picture looks like, what all the elements are that the customer has to get right in order for the success outcome to be achieved. So get some consultants who know that. Again, if I refer back to my, you know, the last company, we had some amazing people in this role of success consultant. They became our highest paid consultants. We charged double standard consulting rates for their time and they had more work than they could deal with. Because once customers worked out that there was a consultant in our organisation who could help them with everything they needed to achieve the outcome, not just getting our product working, they were in huge demand. It was our most profitable line of, of services revenue. It was great. That's fantastic. Yeah, and so build in your in your customer success team or in the organisation if it's a if it's a whole of organisation approach to this, build some resource um, around around success consulting. So pick a pilot, um, define your outcome structure, start talking to customers about outcomes. Define your outcome cycle, start driving the repeating cycle of engagement. Over time, build your success consulting capability and you, can, you will evolve your, your customer outcome program really, really well with those simple steps. That's fantastic, Paul. Thank you. You know, I think you've done such a great job throughout this entire discussion of out, outlining, you know, the need for this and, and the value of it and then some, some insights into how it goes. You know, one of the things that we always like to do on, on, on our podcast is to really come up with a bold challenge question for folks to, that are thinking like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. I want to move forward. I'm just not sure I'm ready to pull the trigger. What sort of bold ideas or actions would you like to see people take or would you challenge them to take to, to move forward with an outcomes-based program? So um, the, the most striking thing that people do early in the program is define the outcome structure. And, you know, I talk to people who run. So, so we offer a, um, we have a, 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 an approach called the 100 Problems Exercise. Um, and, and people who run that 100 Problems Exercise come away from it amazed at the insight that they've gotten into their business about what they really do for their customers. And amazingly how aligned they get. You know, the, there was a, a customer in, um, in Portland, Oregon, that I, that I worked with earlier this year. And the CEO said, you know, one of the most surprising um, and, and strongest benefits he got was everybody was talking the same language throughout his organisation. And so that alignment. So, you know, my, the bold move is run that, run that exercise to define your outcome structure if you can possibly do it. If you're a CS leader or you're a leader of sales or marketing or somewhere else, See if you can get the heads of every department to sit down. It's a half-day exercise, typically run over two or three sessions. But see if you can get everybody involved to just go through that exercise with you. And if you can, you will get an amazing insight into what it is for you to do for your customers. And then CS can take the lead role in let's get that now working. Let's roll that out. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. I love that idea of, you know, that, that alignment is just so critical because I think it is something we still see a lot of silos, a lot of fragmentation, but, but coming together and getting everyone aligned that and actually working through, working through what are our outcomes, you know, working through those themselves, you know, what are our success outcomes that we're delivering is a really, really clever exercise and something that I can see a lot of people being challenged to say, well, I can't spend half a day doing it, but then I, what I really like as well is the idea that CS can lead it. Once you've got it, there's a program there. We've got it articulated mm. on two pieces of paper, go. And it then fits really neatly into that CS mindset and way of thinking. 
Mm. That's mm. that's been great. So, uh, Paul, I, I know um, we barely had time to, to scratch the surface of everything that you can do and, and that, that there is to this. And we hope you'll come back and share more insights of, of how this actually plays out then for like sales and marketing and everyone else at that more granular level. Um, so we really enjoyed what you had to say. Uh, before we close out, um, we'd love to invite you to share, share a shameless plug about how you help customers and how folks who've been inspired by this can reach out and, and connect with you if they're interested in learning more about your program or working with you personally, just share a little information about that, that'd be great. All right, so just a, a couple of things that we can do to help. Um, on the website, there are three free videos that give you in 25 minutes, a bit of an insight into what this whole outcomes thing is about and a bit more detail about the benefits that come from an outcome program. So if you're a CS leader or any other leader and you'd like to get some other people interested in the outcome program, get them to watch those three videos and invest 25 minutes of time and they'll get a really good idea. Mm -hmm. If you get them on board, the next step then is go learn about the fundamentals. And again, on the website, there's um, some uh, uh, videos that give a much deeper dive on that outcome structure, that outcome life cycle and how to apply them. Very, very inexpensive, $39 um, a person mm -hmm. to go through the education. And there's about 90 minutes worth of videos in, in those. If, you're saying, yeah, we want to go ahead with a program, then we can put together, there's a whole series of workshops that we offer that help companies tailor their own program. So it's important that it's not just a stock thing. We provide a framework and then we use a workshop approach for companies to design their own um, outcome program. So the website is outcomeleaders.com. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. And if we're not connected, um, please reach out to me. I'd love to connect with you. I love talking to people who are interested in outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you'd like to have a chat about what you've got in your mind, I'm very, very happy to do that as well. Um, you can also reach me on email at pjh at outcomeleaders.com. And again, there's contact, contact us information on the website, um, LinkedIn or on the website, get in contact with me. I'd love to talk to you. Fantastic. And, and I recommend following Paul on LinkedIn. He shares some great and insightful information. And uh, the links and information he shared will be in the description uh, for this podcast and for the YouTube as well. Awesome. Paul, thank, thank you so much. A really enjoyable conversation. So much, so much you've shared with us. And this, I'm sure a lot of our listeners really come away from this wanting to know more. Um, it really is such a phenomenal topic I, I'm, I'm one that we're all, we all struggle with. You know, and I, 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 I'm a big fan of kind of frameworks and, and structures to how you do things. And I think you, you've outlined some really neat and very simple ways that people can get, get to do this better and deliver much better outcomes. So a huge thank you from us. Yeah, thank you so much. And, uh, and thank you again for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to come and talk about this stuff, as you can tell from the work. <laughs> <laughs> great. All right. Thanks very much. Bye now. Thanks, Paul. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye.